Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, we'll hear about a new study that supports the idea of increasing payouts from the state land trust to help fund education. And we'll visit with Arizona's poet laureate, Alberto Rios. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. ASU's Center for the Study of Economic Liberty has released a report that supports the idea of increasing education funding by increasing the payout from the state's land trust. Joining us now is the Center's Executive Director, Scott Boyer. Thank you so much for joining us. Great to be on Good to have you here. Um, what exactly did this report look at? Sure, so what we look at is the uh, state land trust's performance over the last 10 years, how much they've accumulated in assets Assets and whether or not those assets and the way they've been managing them has been responsible for the people designated as beneficiaries, mainly kids, uh, K through 12 kids, and also some uh, students in higher education as well. What I look at is um, the fact that there's $5 billion in assets in the trust and stocks and bonds, also 9 million acres that's owned by the state land trust as well. And over the last 10 years, it's only paid out to students about 1.8% per year. In fact, in one year in 2010, they paid out zero. No, no dollars came out of the trust to help education at all. I compare that to other states. I look at New Mexico, I look at North Dakota, look at Nevada. Other states have been much more aggressive in their payouts. I look at university endowments. Universities typically pay out 4%. If you're a privately wealthy individual, you're required to pay out 5%. And I say there's actually a lot of room to do more for our kids and, um, and, and go from there to discuss the various options that have been on the table. And indeed, the option that the governor is pushing, his idea is to increase the payout to 10% mm -hmm. for five years right. and then down to 5% for the next five years. Um, why is that a good idea as opposed to something a little more prudent? I think we all understand trust mm -hmm. and taking money out of permanent funds. You rarely think it's here. It's a really good idea to take 10% out for any amount of time. Yeah, so I look at it as the 10% as being an attempt to try to make up for our very poor payouts the last 10 years. So if you think about this last group of students and beneficiaries of the trust, they really were done a disservice by horrible financial markets. The worst financial crisis we've seen since the Great Depression, absolutely volatile um, market performance. So that 10% in part can be thought of as an attempt to make up a little bit for the past generation. 5% we could run forever and be just fine for the trust. So the first five years at 10%, it's a little aggressive. I look at it and say in 2026, even with 10.5, the trust will be no worse than it is today, about $5 billion in assets. And we could just go on autopilot from there and stay at 5% thereafter. There's actually some concern in 2026 about what do we do with the payout then? Because it's, it's really unknown. Do we go back to down to 2.5, right. do we go to zero? I would actually uh, depart from the governor and everyone else and say, S stay at five. Do what right. New Mexico does. I think, and, well, I think some <laughs> so. folks are looking at, you know, 3.5, 4. something along those lines. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that the permanent fund would be pretty much at the same level today in mm -hmm. 2025. I think some would say that's, that's the problem. It would stay at the same level as today, not supposed to be doing that. How yeah. would you respond? Well, I'd say that, yes, it would be at the same level, but we'd have $3 billion more that go to uh, kids, education, to teachers, to pay down debt in our schools. There'd be a lot of benefits that are paid out from the trust. And one of the things I really focus on in the study is what do future trends look like for Arizonans and for our country? If you believe that the past is any indication of where we're headed, there will be technological advance. There will be some progress in the future, some economic growth. All economists agree on that. It's either a question of 2 or 3%, maybe 4% growth. If the future is going to be better, we should have more dollars to pay for education in the future. So why not be more aggressive now helping kids at this moment where we're, we're 48th in the country with spending? <laughs> I know your report also mentioned that the funds are needed now yep. as opposed to in the future. And I think the report, the quote is the future generations won't have as great a need. Yep. That, that's a bit bold, isn't it? Because is. we don't really know what future generations are going to need. A absolutely. And we, we, we don't know. Uh, we don't know if financial Armageddon is around the corner. But our best guess, if you look at the past, is that it's going to be a lot better than today. So over the last 50 years, Arizonans have enjoyed a fourfold increase in income. That means more dollars to fund education, more dollars to afford bigger homes. We have more cars than we ever have had before. We have air conditioning. 50 years ago, Arizonans didn't have air conditioning. So modern life, thanks to an innovation and advance, is better. I think that trend's going to continue, even if it's just a little bit incremental. 
um, we ought to be doing more for kids now. And then obviously the other side would say, yes, that trend could continue, but the, the inflation has to be adjusted here. Mm -hmm. Market trends have to be in, included here. And it sounds like this was based on what, 6% growth? I assume 6%, yeah. So if That's if, pretty bold too. It is, it's 6% um, market returns on stocks and bonds. And mm -hmm. you can get away assuming, the, the public pensions that are supporting ASU and you know other uh, endowments assume 8% returns. So I felt like I was conservative there. If you build in inflation, I would say, well, I need 8% then too. So I use six and uh, take out inflation because it just gets confusing talking about inflation. Six is a very safe um, rate of return assumption. Indeed, and, but, but, and you're saying that 4%, even 5%, mm -hmm. that would make sense as well. Uh, but you still like the idea of 10% for five years? I do, I, I, I'm comfortable with it in that the endowment will still be about where it is now and we could just, put such a um, large amount of money, such an injection into our schools. And the damage done, thanks to these low payouts the last 10 years, has been just tremendous. When you look at how far behind we are, we're not attracting business because of our labor force quality. That's code for we don't have an educated demographic. Let's get money into the schools. Let's try to help students. Let's retain teachers. Teachers are staying less than two years in the schools. This could help with that as well. So it's, it's kind of a big push or an injection that I think we really need. And critics would say, you mentioned how damaged uh, education funding has been because of hits to the fund. Mm -hmm. uh, they will say the damage has been done by lawmakers who simply aren't funding education and that this fund is not meant to, 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 to replace taxes, yep. that word taxes there, uh, for education funding. Mm -hmm. Do they have a point? They do. Um, I am agnostic on what the ideal level of education spending is, what the taxes may need to look like to support education fully. What I'm really interested in is just the trust being managed properly. Get it in line with what other states are doing. Get that payout up, which even State Treasurer DeWitt agrees on. He says, let's get it up to 3.75. Let's move it up. That's one of the main messages of the study is there's room, let's go up. Any move up is an improvement over where we are now. And you know, then just go from there. You know? So um, I, I think that uh, the bigger question of how do we fund education uh, with all of these various sources of funding and these various plans, that's, someone, that's for a lot of different stakeholders. I'm, I'm just really focused on the trust piece right. and, 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 and you, getting that right. And you mentioned the treasurer, State yep. Treasurer DeWitt. He has called, obviously it's a governor's idea, mm -hmm. not necessarily what the study looked at, mm -hmm. but the governor's idea, he's called it irresponsible, and obviously he and the governor don't agree on this, to say right. it, the least. Um, are we approaching, I mean, to say 6% growth, to say 10% for 10 years, mm -hmm. to say keeping it, in, you know, we're talking about something that is meant for perpetuity. Is he, does he have a point? I don't think so in, in the sense that if you look at um, the long-term health of that endowment and the intent of the trust, which is to maximize the benefits for the kids, you have to look at a dynamic picture over time. We have not been maximizing the benefit of the kids for the last 10 years. Something really should be done about that. It's, it's almost, I think of the governor's proposal, they're not as irresponsible, but a makeup for what's happened, reparations essentially for really bad damage that we've done to our state. And, and that's my um, takeaway. Whether it depletes the endowment a little bit, I'm not that concerned about if we can help kids out now. You know, and that's, that's my bottom line on, on, on the endowment size is not as important to me as just getting money released. Last point yeah. on this. Center for the Study of Economic Liberty has been reported that it's funded in part by the Koch mm -hmm. brothers, correct? It is, yes. And uh, that the center has an agenda because mm -hmm. it is funded in part by the Koch brothers. Sure. Is that a valid argument? I don't think so. You know, the Koch Foundation supports over 400 universities across the country. You know, it's, it would be like saying the supporters of, um, of, of Horizon Television are somehow affecting your broadcast decisions. It's, it's really, uh, in this case, I have no idea what the Koch Foundation thinks about the study. They're supporting economists and philosophers and political economists around the country to do work and engage students in ideas that we think are relevant and need to be heard now, helping kids out to help our state. That's the main message of my study. I have no idea what the Kochs think about that. And I think it's absurd to, um, you know, be, be saying that, you know, our study is being driven through some kind of ideological agenda or lens as opposed to these are people giving money to a university trying to make a difference in students' lives at ASU and in the community's lives and then doing what hundreds of other th philanthropists do every year, giving money and just trying to help the conversation. So no agenda? No, I, I mean, the agenda is... Um, you know, wanting to contribute to a discussion of ideas. You well, know, as, as much as, you know, a lot of other people's agendas are supporting music, athletics, and many other things. Well, I appreciate our discussion. It's good to have you here. Great Thanks for here. joining us. Thank appreciate you. it. Yep.
Arizona's poet laureate Alberto Rios is out with his 13th collection of poems. The new book is titled A Small Story About the Sky, and it focuses on images and memories of people and places along the U.S.-Mexico border. Here now is Alberto Rios. Good to see you again. Thanks for having me back. Congratulations yeah. on the new book. These, these really are something. Did these poems come to you differently than past poems. I think they did. In fact, the poem, uh, th this book was made as a different book to start with. It was a book originally of my own poems, and these still are my poems, but they have been affected by being poet laureate. So they now have something called Poems of Public Purpose, which are poems I felt compelled to write as I've been on this journey. Are they different kinds of poems? I mean, do you, uh, do you recognize the metaphors when composing these poems any easier, any more, uh, any? They're, they're more publicly intended. And so, and, okay. and so I think where I can write to the personal me in so many poems, in this particular case, I wasn't writing my poems. I was writing poems that had a different, that had to have a different kind of impact. And it, it's writing from the outside in rather than the inside out. Interesting. But still, you, you, you are still writing poetry. You're still kind of oh, dancing yes. around the topic and you got oh, yeah. the metaphors here and you got the symbolism yeah. there, correct? None of that changes. Yeah. None of that changes. And I don't want to make it uh, a, an inadequate or, or minor kind of work. I, I think I've been able to elevate it, in the discourse, both public and private, into something that I think is worthy. Did you learn something writing uh, these poems? I did, a lot. And, and one of the best things I learned is that we just can't always speak for ourselves. We sometimes have to lend our voices to those who cannot speak. Uh, in the same way that the baker, for example, might bake a loaf of bread and I get to eat that bread. I, I am doing that. Now when I, when I write, it's like baking that loaf of bread for somebody, I think. Interesting, interesting way to put it. Uh, one of your lines, the border is an equation in search of an equals sign. Yeah. Explain, please. Well, that comes out of a, a, a long series of one-line ideas, conceptualizations of the border. I grew up on the border. I grew up in Nogales. And a line like that it, it is an equation in search of an equal sign. The, the border itself, the fence, is not an equal sign. It suggests something is less than as opposed to equal to. And I think that, that is a statement of that. When you write this kind of poetry now, mm -hmm. and, and, and you know, images and metaphors become statements in certain yes. ways, um, do you have to watch yourself? Do you have to watch, do you want to be t I don't want to be teaching, but taught a lesson here. Yeah. I want to read poetry. No, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think I've ever suffered that. I don't think I'm out to, to write a pedagogical kind of work, or uh, you know, I'm not out to give an essay or a lecture. I think I have a lot of fun with the imagery, and yet, in that fun, there is, of course, always going to be an intent, a mm -hmm. lesson, but not in the way that I think you would get in school. I don't talk, I don't write in red ink. I just, I think I, I write and I have fun when I write, and I think I w if I wouldn't want to hear it, I'm not going to say it. Do, do all of your images have meaning? I mean, some of the images are very vivid. One line, apricots are eggs laid in trees by invisible golden hens. I mean, I love the fact that they're invisible golden hens, <laughs> by the way. But I mean, does that have a meaning? Does that have a metaphor? It, or is that just a beautiful image? It, it is meant to be purely a visual association. And it is just simply a way of leading us to something we wouldn't have been led to had we just been sitting there on the couch. And so I, I, I think it has meaning. It has, by, in the sense that it has direction. It has a, a composite uh, intent. It, it's gonna take us somewhere. Indeed, and, and another line was gnats, little gnats. They're sneezes that are still flying around. I mean, yeah. again, you're, you're always moving in a direction with these yeah. things, aren't you? Yes. And, and it's funny, uh, I, I use a particular form, I'm, I'm fond of this, and this came out of doing public work called a gregeria, which is basically a one-line form. So what you're, what you're repeating, these that you've been repeating, are, are really meant to be one-line poems. They are not, ne even though they are, in this particular book, put next to others, they are nevertheless meant to be one-line efforts. And I think the idea of a sneeze, the gnats being a sneeze still oh, flying around. It's just, yeah, you it's, know, it's perfect. That's all we want to know. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's perfect. Well, those are one lines. My favorite poem in the book, I want you to read from this right now. It's a short poem. And, uh, uh, and, and when you're done, I'll have some questions on it. Okay. But uh, uh, this was what, how the sky was made. And, and go ahead and read this for us, if you would. How the sky is made. 
We have camped out, eaten, filled ourselves, told the best stories we know, and gotten tired. All of us sleepy, we douse the fire and watch as so much of it gets up. Those sparks and bits and chuffs of smoke, they suddenly, if wearily, rise to make the sky, go to their second jobs as stars in the night, smoke wandering to work as clouds in the horizon of the next day. We let them go. We ourselves, so weary, get ready for the hard work of sleep in which next days are found. Where did that poem come from? That is gorgeous. Where did that poem come from? Well, you know, uh, much like the idea of the gnats being part of the idea that sparks rise is just one of those moments, if you've ever been camping, you see it go up, you lift it up, it's often against a night sky, and it just simply uh, told itself to me. Those, those sparks are what stars are. And the smoke becomes the clouds. Yeah. And we, but again, er, sparks become smoke becomes, yes. we go to sleep and get to, everything's moving forward, isn't yes, it? Yes, it's a good observation, and I think that's very important to me. I think it starts to all go forward to make something. What that thing that's being made is, ultimately, is hard to say, but it is moving us uh, from where we are to what we're thinking, feeling, or, right. or imagining. Yes. We, we, we cannot be static after having read one of these lines. Um, how do you know when a poem like that, or any of your poems, how do you know when the poem is finished? Yeah, you don't. It's one of those things that, that haunts you as a writer, and there's an old saying amongst writers that, that, that novels or poems or anything else are never finished, they're simply abandoned. I, I don't think that's necessarily accurate, but I know that I could keep going, I could write more, I could do more, and you have to have a big picture view of this. I will write more, and I will write more about that poem. It just won't be called that poem. Interesting. But the ideas, the metaphors, all of that action, it'll find its way. Yeah. I know musicians sometimes are afraid that if they can't remember the melody or what they wrote the next day, then it wasn't worth remembering, but they still are worried that it's gone forever. And you're saying yeah. it's not gone forever. I don't think it ever goes. And so many writers, I, I think, really uh, are writing one idea. They just are looking at all of these facets of it. They're turning it around and around and around, and it's enough. Yeah. How do you know how to start a poem? Mm. That's, you know, sometimes poems are imagined into being. They're needed into being. Sometimes they are just offered to you by something that just makes you think twice. I love that second choice where, where just suddenly I'm, I turn around and I see something, hear something, smell something. And in that moment, when I get a smell of rosemary, in that moment, something happens to me. Can I make that into words? Not always. Sometimes I just want to eat it. Yeah. <laughs> but sometimes I want to write that. And sometimes, I, I, I noticed you had a poem in there about Philip Curtis. Yes. The painter whose works are at yes. the Phoenix Art Museum. Who's actually on the cover. And I, I was going <laughs> to say the cover has a Phil, it, 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 that is Philip Curtis. Yes, it thing. is. Because yes, I was going to say that looks an awful lot like a Philip, kind of the <laughs> surrealism sort of thing. Yes. I mean, you can stand there watch, looking at a painting and a poem hits you, correct? Yeah, absolutely true. I think that's an age old process that, that writers, artists of all sorts have all, always shared. You're moved. <laughs> you know, we just had you read a poem aloud. Should poems always be able to be to, to hold up if read yeah. aloud? No, they don't. And so many of the best work, I think, is much too dense to be read effectively out loud. The, the human mind can't move fast enough to, to, to actually take that all in. To read a poem on the page, especially a longer kind of poem or a more complicated poem, is to serve it. You, you need to spend a little time with it, and reading aloud is so performative, we, to, in this day and age, we don't have time for taking time. Right. So, so in the, we've all taken classes, poetry, English classes, mm -hmm. whatever, and we've looked at work and we've gone, I have no idea what I'm reading. I can't even find the meter. I don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. has, has poetry, has it, can it still be too impenetrable? <laughs> Absolutely. So much of it is for me uh, as well. And there's no, no getting around it. But what I always recognize when I'm reading a poem, even that I, if I can't enter it, it helps me to understand that if I don't know what I'm reading in that first line, it's telling me to read it some other way. Don't read it in the regular way I'm used to reading. So I've got to listen for cadence. I've got to listen for pure sonics, maybe. Mm -hmm. I've got to listen for 
only rhyme or lack of rhyme, it, it's telling me that it's not gonna make sense the way I'm used to. And I don't mind that challenge. It doesn't mean that I get it or that I, I ultimately think it's, it succeeds. It's okay to say that some poems just don't work. It's perfectly okay. But I don't wanna be the one who simply gives up because I can't get the first part of it or I can't get, get it on first read. Interesting. I think there's more there almost to, the human mind doesn't let us write something that is inconsequential so that a poem that it makes it, that it has gotten to the page. Somebody has seen something there. I want to look for that too. But if it's too dense for me, yeah. it's too dense for me. Then there's nothing wrong with right, that. Right. Absolutely right. That's and if, why, it's, if it's too yeah. light for you, yeah. then there you go. Yeah, there's a lot of choice. And I, I don't think there's anything at all wrong with that. It's not a monolith. I think, I think poetry, we tend to think of it that way and maybe teach it that way. You've got to like it all or there's something wrong with you, but it's not, not accurate in the least. When you read reviews least. of your, your poetry, and, and when you get you know, emails and responses, yeah. but mostly when the critics kind of, and they say certain things, do you ever go, well, I didn't think of that. Well, well, well I'll be doggone. Sure. I, I think it, language itself offers that. It, 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 it sometimes tricks us into letting it work on the page and, and start playing. Somebody else is going to be responsive to that in a way that I didn't even understand I was an instrument to that it, it just is there and, and somebody else will pick up on it. And I think it's exciting when it does that. However, it doesn't mean that I don't have the job of writing a poem that I think makes sense on, on my terms. That somebody else can see it a different way is great. But I, I, I think it's one of the um, hallmarks of an early writer where, where I get a, a first year student saying, well, it's okay, to, it's okay with me if you don't understand it. And I say, well, then why did you show it to me? <laughs> yeah. Of course I need right. to understand it. And, and so I've got that first responsibility to make a poem, that that poem can be multiples, that it, that it can extend out. I think it's just exciting. As far as your favorite poets, mm. inspirations, mm -hmm. favorite, who? Yeah, I'm, who? Gonna say, I'm gonna say something that's surprising. My favorite poets are not poets in, in, in the traditional sense of going to a book of poems. And the reason I say that is, if I go to a book of poems, that's where the stuff is. There's no discovery to be made. I love it and I read it and I'm instructed and edified by it, but it's not, for me, the place to make a discovery. If I turn around and I look, as we were saying, at a, a campfire and those, those sparks, I need to find it somewhere that it isn't. And I think for me, the inspiration then often comes, let's say if I'm, I, I would say, for example, my favorite poet, is Gabriel Garcia Marquez, fiction writer. Because when I'm reading that work, I find moments in there that are simply extraordinary, yes. and it's not where I expected to find it. I expected for it to be plot and to keep moving me from A to Z, but something suddenly stands up and stops me, and I'm saying, that's almost illegal in fiction. Right, You're not right. supposed to stop, you're supposed to keep. And I say, that's the moment. That's it. That's, that's something I want to pay attention to. People uh, ascending to heaven, butterflies that's falling right. from the sky, Remedio, old men chained Remedios to a tree. the beauty yes, and, and so whatever. Incidentally, in that scene, perfect magical realism. She's ascending into the sky yes. and she's been washing sheets with the ladies of the village. Yes. Hard to come by. So as she's ascending, she, it's great. It's a miracle for her. But one of the ladies yells up to her, drop <laughs> the sheet. Yes. I Very mean, funny moment. Perf uh, amazing book. Yeah. Uh, last question. Uh, we've got about a minute left here. Poetry's place in society. Is there a place for poetry in society? Yeah, I think there is. Uh, one, of the, one of the distinctions I use when I've been traveling around is say it and I will understand it. Say it well and I will feel it. That difference, I think, is crucial. It explains the humanities, but it says something about us as human beings. I think ultimately you can have all the words in the world and all you've got is a dictionary. A dictionary is efficient, but a poem is effective. Well, uh, these poems are more than effective. Beautiful collection, a beautiful book. Thank you so much and Thank congratulations you. on a wonderful work. Thank you so much. Thank Ned. you. Wednesday on Arizona Horizon, we'll hear about a new report that looks at the state's future in a variety of ways, and we'll visit with the author of an extraordinary and inspirational book about life's challenges and rewards. That's on the next Arizona Horizon. That's it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.